Every musician is a child at heart. No matter how grown up and straight faced and serious you might think you are, making music is a form of play. And it's arguably at its very best when it comes from a place of innocence, of discovery, of unselfconscious exploration, and above all, the desire to have a lot of fun, which are all fundamentally childlike characteristics. Fender and Lego have in common that they are both companies who make things we love to play with. They also have in common that both companies were founded in the first half of the 20th century. 1949 was the year Fender produced their first electric guitar and Lego made their first interlocking building system. And both companies released their flagship products in the 1950s. The Lego brick we know and love in 1958 and Fender Stratocaster in 1954. Fender and Lego also share a wide overlap in their philosophies of design. In the middle of the 20th century, the prevailing design paradigm was modernism. Modernism is about the implementation of the latest techniques and technologies in service of a really democratic approach to commerce, which was especially relevant in the 1950s, just a few years after our civilization had survived the brutal and tragic battle with one of the most undemocratic regimes ever created. We needed to be reminded that progress occurs through cooperation, through inclusivity, through creativity. The basic principle of LEGO's building block is modular creativity. The block on its own doesn't really do much, but when you start combining it with other blocks, the possibilities become endless. And while LEGO do package the block into sets from which you can build a specific object, LEGO explicitly encourage you to put the instructions aside to combine your set with other sets, and to start experimenting. In a similar way, Fender will sell you a complete guitar that you can use as is, but Fender also fully embraced the idea that musicians enjoy being as creative with their instruments as they do with their music. You may not be aware that Fender sells separately all the component parts of their guitars for you to combine and modify and experiment with as you please. And while this is obviously good business now, it's been at the heart of their design from the very start. It might seem crazy now that their earliest instruments fetch incredible prices on the vintage market as long as they're all factory original. But the idea behind their bolt-on neck system was that when your frets wore out, you could just take off the neck and put a new one on. These days, a refret is likely to be more affordable than a good replacement neck, but it shows where Fender were coming from in terms of letting musicians get to work on their own instruments. This Lego set also includes a Hank Marvin style red body, but today I'm making the Black Strat, reminiscent of Eric Clapton's Blackie, a guitar he assembled by picking the best parts from three strats he bought in Nashville in 1970. A body from a 1956 strat and a neck from a 1957. Blackie sold at auction for a million dollars in 2004, which just goes to show what you can achieve with what we in the community would refer to as a parts caster. It's this principle of modularity that makes both companies' products so accessible. Not every child's parents have the means to put a Lego Millennium Falcon under the Christmas tree, but Lego's smaller sets are very affordable. And because each set has the potential to become so many other things besides the car, or the dragon, or the pirate ship it was packaged as, LEGO's building blocks represent unmatched value for money in terms of the amount of creative playtime you can get from them. And in the same way, you can, if you have the means, spend many thousands on fabulous custom creations from the Fender Custom Shop, which you can, of course, specify down to the last detail, which is its own form of creativity. But for the last few decades, Fender have been pioneers in bringing affordable instruments to market. Instruments that, despite their lower price point, don't compromise on their build quality and functionality. And because they follow the same design principles, are just as easy to upgrade and modify as their more expensive counterparts. Indeed, some of their most affordable guitars are bought and played and tinkered with by musicians who could, if they chose, afford guitars at much higher price points. Leo Fender was famously not a guitarist, and so when he set about designing his first guitars, he turned to his musician friends for their input and advice, 
thereby creating arguably the first crowdsourced guitar design. The Fender Telecaster was an answer to the question of what kind of guitar would the working guitarists Leo knew like to own and play? And the Fender Stratocaster was an answer to the question of how would those working guitarists improve on the Telecaster? This, to me, suggests a degree of humility that I've always found very appealing about the Fender brand. Humility that is all too rare in a marketplace where too many companies predicate their success on telling you how to use their products, and in many cases actively preventing you from doing anything else with them. I won't name names, but you might be watching this video on one of those products right now. And that same humility is at the very root of LEGO's humble building block. Of course, you can treat your LEGO sets like airfix models if you like, but again, LEGO are militant in their belief that the real life of their product comes from kids, kids of any age, taking a big pile of LEGO bricks and conjuring out of it whatever idea pops into their heads, and then pulling that apart and making something else, and then something else, and so on. I've lately been on a bit of a crusade about manufacturers that don't make their products with sustainability in mind. It may be true that Fender and LEGO launched their flagship products in an era when the health of the planet's ecosystem hadn't become the priority it is now. And I'm also not saying that either company has had a perfect environmental scorecard over the years. But the LEGO building block and the Fender Stratocaster have in common what is for me one of the essential features of sustainability, which is that if they're properly looked after, they can be used and enjoyed by multiple generations of players. And the same goes for this amp, a 1965 Princeton. Known as a black face because of the black control panel used on Fender amps in this era, the Princeton amp is a favorite of studio and stage, has been reissued multiple times, and vintage mid-60s examples are still commonly used by guitarists because the components used at the time were durable and high quality, and the simple and well-organized circuit design is easy to work on. It's already beyond impressive that it's even possible to keep an electronic appliance alive after 60 years, and is testament to how well-loved these amps are that musicians would go to the effort and expense instead of just grabbing a new one. I've been a Fender fan all my life. I've owned hundreds of their products from tuner pedals to cables to strings to picks to PA speakers, and of course amplifiers and basses and guitars. I currently have a beautiful 1959 Bassman reissue from around 2001 that we'll be looking at in my next video, and a parts telecaster featuring a Fender Roadworn neck, a Fender AVRI 1958 body, and all Fender Roadworn hardware. I also have a project guitar arriving this week based around another Roadworn Fender Telecaster neck. Watch out for a video series on that one coming soon. I do love strats, but only when other people play them. It frustrates me that having owned a few and played dozens, I still have yet to find one that I can properly bond with. It's nice then that owning this strat comes without the added pressure of having to play it well or make it sound good. Instead, it will take pride of place on my shelves in my studio, where it will serve as a useful and constant reminder that playing music is, first and foremost, playing. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.